Was Paul really against marriage? Well, some would think so in reading the passages here in 1 Corinthians 7. Let's talk about that today in the Word. Good morning and welcome back to Today in the Word. Hi, I'm Glenn Schaefer. Thank you for following along as we're here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to go through a lot of verses today, verse 25 down through 40. And the reason for that is it's all on the same subject, and I want to keep this together. There are many who have believed that Paul did not approve of marriage and that he would even had a bent against women and some of his teachings and writings because they would not look at it within the context of the Scripture. In this passage we're going to read today, some have actually thought that Paul would have not been in favor of marriage. You're going to see that as we go through this, why some people believe that when actually it's not true at all. Let's read verse 25. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment from the Lord, yet I give judgment as one whom the Lord in his mercy has made trustworthy. Now, what he says here about virgins, it's talking about male and female unmarried, not just young ladies or women, but it is male and female that are unmarried. And he says, the Lord didn't teach this, but he says, I give judgment as one whom the Lord in his mercy has made trustworthy. So what he's speaking is authoritative. It's not any less inspired or authoritative. He says, because the Lord has entrusted this to me. Now look at verse 26. I suppose, therefore, that it is good because of the present distress that it is good for a man to remain as he is, meaning to remain single or to remain married. Now this verse here puts it all in context. Paul's writing to the Corinthians about 15 years before his own life would be taken. He's writing the same year or right about the same time that Nero comes to power. The persecution is starting to rise, and the apostle sees what is ahead. And he identifies it within context here for the Corinthians in this present crisis. So he's not giving an overall word for marriage through all time. It is God's order for man and woman to be together in marriage. That's the common order of God. There are those who are given a gift of singleness. But here Paul is addressing this present crisis. So let's read this one more time, verse 26 again. I suppose, therefore, that this is good because of the present distress, or some translations say present crisis, that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be loosed. Are you loosed from a wife? Do not seek a wife. This idea of bound, that's not negative, but covenant in the biblical understanding is a binding together. So he used this word, if you're bound to a wife, don't seek to get loose. And if you're not married, don't seek a wife. So some would say, well, he didn't want people to be married. No, he understands the consequences and life responsibilities of what it would be like to care for a family and the struggles and maybe even the embarrassment of trying to provide in a crisis time. So he says, in this present crisis, it's good for you to remain as you are. Now he continues to go through this in verse 28. But even if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh, but I would spare you. And that's all that he's saying. If you do marry, it's okay, you've not sinned. But I'm telling you, it's going to be hard. You're about to go through some tremendous persecutions. You know, Paul was told that he would be bound when he went to Jerusalem. He was told what would happen to him from his first early days of conversion when Ananias came to him. He was told of the things that he would suffer. 
Well, Paul knew what was ahead of him and what was ahead for the Christians, particularly those in Corinth. And he's saying to them, I'm going to try to spare you some of the trouble as believers that you should focus on the gospel, focus on how you can please God and not have the responsibility of marriage because that's a tremendous responsibility. He's not saying that generally across the board for all believers, but he's saying that in that present crisis and that present time. So let's keep reading verse 29. But this I say, brethren, the time is short, so that from now on, even those who have wives should be as though they have none, and those who weep as though they do not weep, and those who rejoice as they did not rejoice, and those who buy as though they did not possess. And those who use this world as not misusing it, for the form of this world is passing away. That idea, the form of this world, is not talking about the second coming at the end in the resurrection. He's speaking specifically of the Jewish polity, the Jewish world that was about to come to an end. Jesus prophesied that that generation would not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. And within that 40 year, period in 70 AD, about 15 years after Paul's writing of this, the destruction of Jerusalem came. Hebrews talks about that which is obsolete is vanishing away. It's coming to an end because the temple would be destroyed. The whole system of the world, the whole system that God set up originally, that everything rotated around Jerusalem, around the temple, was about to be brought to an end. Why? Because apostate Israel had rejected the Messiah. One greater than the temple was in their midst, and they rejected him. And Paul was living in this time, and he knew what was coming ahead, and that would be coming to an end short. So when he says the time is short, that's what he refers to. What it would take to be married, to have children, to raise a family. He said, this present time, it would be better for you to remain as you are. Now he says in verse 32, but I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. He's not talking about being worldly. He just said there's responsibilities to provide for the family. That takes a lot of time, a lot of energy. How are you going to do that persecuted as Christians? When you're not able to buy and sell and trade as you normally would and go about your business, he said, I'm trying to spare you. He said, I don't want you to have extra care on you. Verse 34, there is a difference between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. He said, I want you to see the difference. If someone's not married, all she focuses on is serving the Lord, keeping herself holy before the Lord and body and spirit and focusing upon the kingdom of God. But when you get married, your husband, your family, all of those responsibilities are an addition. Now, those of you that are married, even without crisis, with even without persecution, we know this to be true. What I do want to emphasize here is how important Paul places upon obedience to the Lord. You know, sometimes we take that as secondary. We take life as primary, obedience to God in the kingdom as secondary. And I understand the kingdom mindset is to carry on life, for the kingdom of God to be spread into every place and every workplace. We have responsibilities, and God never wants us to abandon those areas of responsibilities. At the same time, the mindset, the heart, has to be focused upon the kingdom. And that's why he says, it's better for you not to be any other than the way you are. If you're single, stay that way. If you're married, stay this way. Verse 35, and this I say, for your own profit, not that I may put a leash on you, but from what is proper and that you may serve the Lord without distraction. He said, I'm telling you this, not to throw a net over you, to bind you up. He said, I don't want what I say to bind you up, but I want it to be for your own profit, which one more time shows us he's writing this specifically for the Christians in that age and in Corinth. It's for their benefit, their own profit that he's speaking to. And he says, I just don't want you to be distracted. Now, verse 36, 
But if any man thinks he is behaving improperly toward his virgin, if she is past the flower of youth, and thus it must be, let him do what he wishes. He does not sin, let them marry. Now this context here is not talking about a man toward an unmarried woman. It's talking about a father and his daughter. And he says, if any man, meaning a father, thinks he is behaving improperly, in other words, pressure is coming, his daughter is past the flower of youth. It's time for her to be married. And the girl wants to be married. Dad wants to marry her. And he says, what I'm telling you, I don't want it to be a bondage or a leash. He said, even though it would be easier because of the persecution, if you decide to go ahead and let her be married, because in those days, Marriages were arranged. Parents agreed to it, and parents made those arrangements. He said, you have not sinned. Let them go ahead and marry. Let them be married. You've not done wrong. Because those dads would have carried the burden as Christians. What am I to do about my daughter? Persecution is coming. We see it rising. The apostle is telling this. He said, listen, you have a right to make that decision. You're behaving uh, in the right way. Don't think that you have sinned. Go ahead and let them marry if that's what you think you ought to do. However, in the next verse, 37, nevertheless, he who stands steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but has power over his own will and has so determined in his heart that he will keep his virgin or his daughter, does well. So then he who gives her in marriage does well, but he who does not give her in marriage does better. When he says does better, he's not talking about morally. He's talking about for the sake of their profit. And may, he says of a man, just has a conviction in his heart. At this time, I cannot let my daughter be married. He says if he's steadfast in his heart, having no necessity. He says there's no reason for her daughter, his daughter to be married except he just feels like she's not supposed to. Then he's done well. You see what Paul is trying to do is help the Corinthians face very difficult times. And so he's addressing both unmarried and then the married. Verse 39, he says, A wife is bound by law as long as her husband lives. But if her husband dies, she at liberty to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. But she is happier if she remains as she is, according to my judgment, and I think I also have the Spirit of God. Now, I'm going to keep that within the context of that error of persecution. He says, how about a wife? He said, a wife then needs to know that she is bound in the covenant of marriage. Well, a husband needs to know the same thing. That he's bound in that covenant of marriage as long as a spouse lives. But if the spouse dies, then she is at liberty to be remarried. And Paul is saying, even in that time of crisis, she could go ahead and be married. But he says, I'm telling you, in my opinion, which I believe is by the Holy Spirit, she'd be happier if she does not remarry. Now, I've got to tell you, in the proper exegesis of the scripture, I believe it's within the context of persecution. But if I could reflect here a little bit, you know, it's okay if a spouse passes away for that person to go ahead and get remarried. There's a lot of baggage people bring with them, though, in that other <laughs> new uh, spouse. They're bringing so many things, and it does cause a lot of, uh, <laughs> what would you say? Well, just put what he says. He said it would be easier, be happier. Well, I'll leave that up to each person. But Paul is making this specifically clear in that time of persecution. I love how Paul addresses so many practical things in the book of Corinthians. Thank you for walking through this today in the Word.